Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Michael Graves, thank you so much for spending some more time with me today. And it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I love being here. It's great, great talking to you, Evan. Thanks. And we're here today, of course, to discuss the sprawling new box set from Craft Recordings. <laughs> And it's titled Written in Their Soul, The Stack Songwriter Demos. And you, Mr. Graves, are the restoration expert and mastering engineer uh, credited on this album. And our audience should really understand what's really unique about this project because the set highlights demos from the Stacks years and of the writers who worked with the Stacks label. And in at least one case, there's a, an unidentified um, group playing. So that people should understand that's kind of what you know, you were given to work with. So I think the interesting way to start this conversation would say, you know, Cheryl uh, Pawlewski, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Pawlewski. 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 And I'm, and I am Polish, so I should really. <laughs> Come on, you know better. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that correctly. But she is the producer of this project and uh, you guys have worked together for many years. And so when she approached you, what was kind of her approach? How did she present it to you? Well, she, she has been working on this thing. This thing has been, she's been nurturing this for about 17 years. So she, she's worked with every major label that there is. And for a while she was at Concord. Um, this was probably about 17, 18 years ago. And she was working on a 50th anniversary sax project. And she was going through the archives, looking at tapes. And she started seeing tapes that she hadn't seen before. And they look, you know, like demos. And right. that intrigued her. But unfortunately, as she likes to say, she didn't have the budget to go on a fishing expedition. You know, she has she's there for it to do a job to compile these things that that she's supposed to work on. So it just stuck in her brain that there's hey, there's some there's could be some really cool things here. So she um, <clears throat> what this project is they're they're songwriting demos. So they're not band demos or songwriting demos. And these are where the songwriters at stacks. Um, so the songwriters demos are to demonstrate how great the songs are. They're trying to sell these songs. Right. And that's one of the great things about the performances of these songs. They are, I don't want to uh, project too much, but they are, I don't know if it's just they're innately talented at doing this, but it really sounds like they are selling the song. They're just putting their heart and, into the song. Um, it's like the the genesis of, of these songs. So it's really great to hear them, hear them that way. So. So these are songwriting demos and what they would do is at stacks they would they would somebody gets an idea um these are musicians and writers and artists that do this 24 7. so right. i always tell people any i put away any idea that you have a as a demo as sort of being sort of half-assed right put that aside this is not that at all they may be bare bones recordings but the but the musicianship and the artistry is just top drawer and the recordings are, are really great too we can talk about how the, the actual original recordings were probably great. What I had to work with was not so much. Right. But we'll talk about that later. Okay. But once they recorded these songs, they would immediately go to East Memphis, East Memphis Publishing Company. And that they are the publishing arm of Stax. And they were in charge of the composition. So they would copyright the song and they would be in charge of collecting any royalties. And also, you know, shopping out the song. You're finding uh, artists to sing these songs. Right. Um, so a lot of these songs you might be from like art, your audience might be familiar with them but you may not be familiar with these vocalists singing them because either you see the songwriters and every one of these songwriters could completely sing you know you wonder why they didn't become performers and because they're so great at, at delivering these songs right um so once these reels these audio tapes were presented to the um were i guess deposited at the east memphis publishing that was it they were forgotten about um, until, you know, something, either something happened with them or it didn't, but the songwriters, they're not worried. They're just keep going. They just keep writing new songs. Cause that's, that's their job. So, you know, years fast forward to Cheryl with this idea of, of, uh, these songwriting demos, she knew that she, you know, to actually go through the archives of stacks and uh, at Concord to see what was there, it just, the, the budget was not there. And she was doing it by that time. She was already on to another label. I think she was a rhino at that time. Right. So. She really had to have any access to it but, but she, she remembered knew, she remembered right her oh, kind of she, yeah. she has so many when i first started working with cheryl uh she would tell me about a project and i would think 
you know, and a few months later, nothing happened. I'm like, well, what happened to the one you told me last month? Oh, uh, she said, look, I've at any given moment, I've got, you know, uh, many different projects hanging in the air. And I'm, sometimes they drop, sometimes they don't. Everything has to line up, but don't get too excited until it starts to actually happen. But right. there, there's always any given moment she's got a pretty good bag of ideas. That's the way to do <laughs> it, I think. In her brain. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. That's you, okay. The first question you asked was, how was my reaction when I first heard about this? Well, right. Like, how did she, how did she present you with this, um, you know, this, this gig in other words, and, you know, I did some quick math. Let's see. This is the thing. It's a, it's a big, it's a seven disc package with a 146 tracks and it clocks in at seven hours and 29 minutes and 40 seconds. So, uh, you know, I just wondering w- with your own workflow, like how did you mm-hmm. sort of, how did she sort of say, Hey, how are we going to do this? This is, this is not a 40 minute record that you're going to remaster and, and, or, um, restore, you know, what was yeah. sort of that conversation? Like, Whoa, this is a big, this is a big <laughs> thing. And you've done these box sets before you, d- you just finished the Blondie set and, and all of those things, but this is a big one. And, and yeah. it probably required more restoration than say Blondie or some, some other. That's right. It, it exactly. It did. And it- and I sort of had when well, my first some of my first the first projects I worked on like 20 years ago when I started, they were multi-disc projects from dust to digital. And those were all recordings from 78s, right. 78 RPM records. So I, you know, from the very beginning, I'm used to large quantities of music and trying to distill that into a, a actual workflow. So when I started working with Cheryl around 2013, that's when she mentioned the the stacks thing to me. So it's it's always been in my head. Wow. And every couple of years, she'll like, hey, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Then about four years ago, maybe three and a half, four years ago, she said, okay, things are lining up. So she had narrowed it down to the whatever the hundred and something songs that you mentioned there. Um, and the way I had to actually do a little bit of pre-work on them before i did the real work on them because she's the only one with this idea in her head right now it's just me and her maybe a couple of people that know this is happening right and one of the things you want to do is make sure that the artists or the people performing are on board with this this whole idea and if she had presented some of these recordings in the state that they were which were not very good Mm. you know there's you run the risk of someone might saying yeah that's a great song but i you know that sounds terrible and, you know, there's no amount of technology that can fix that. When Cheryl knows in her brain, yes, I know that these can be fixed, and I know the guy that can do it. <laughs> I know a guy. I know yeah. a guy. So we had to put a little polish on them at the beginning just to make sure that we didn't hit that roadblock. Or I say we, but Cheryl didn't hit that roadblock in the beginning. So right. they were, all the artists were receptive, and they were really happy to work to, you know, have these songs out. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, the sources that arrived to you. And I did read the liner notes are, are really, really good. If you pick up the box set, you should check out, uh, of course, make sure you make sure you do your reading because there's a lot of information to be gleaned from. It's the a package. great story. You know, there's really two. Sto- the obvious story is this is the story of the stack songwriters and, right. and, and just that and just that everything around that. That's that's the main story. And that's why we're here talking. But the second story is how this crazy thing came to be, which is what we're talking about now. I just want to make sure we don't over gloss over the the top line story. No, but, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, and, the, uh, but but what were the, the so some of these recordings had already been transferred from tape. Of course, I guess when you said they were deposited at the publishers, who yeah. knows where they, they put them in some, you know, storage room somewhere. And I guess over the years they had said, what are we going to do with this stuff? Um, and put a lot of it on DAT. So what, what kinds of things did you get? Did you get primarily the DATs or did you I get, got, I got wave files with with uh nondescript names like like dat four five zero underscore oh one five eight dot wave that's all i got and that's because cheryl so back yeah someone around the late 80s these these reels were transferred to dats now dats you can we can argue about dats but i fundamentally dats can make are capable of capturing really good sound right but it's all dependent on how the music is fed to it right so i my feeling is that there was somebody you know somebody said hey you <laughs> go take these reel to reels and run them down to dat because uh nobody's learning how to use a reel to reel player anymore right so they did that and i think that and i don't want to be too harsh on them because um 
whoever did this, I'm glad they transferred these 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 recordings to debts because we probably again wouldn't be here talking. But I think that maybe the person or people that transfer these didn't have a great working knowledge of how real to real players work. And the idea of, you know, a quarter inch tape can be uh, full track mono, it can be two track stereo, it can be four track stereo, you know, and there's no indication by looking at the physically looking at a quarter inch tape as to how many tracks there are. So a lot of and a lot of times, some of the recordings I got, they sounded like maybe four track recordings played with a two track head, or right. vice versa. Mm-hmm. So and a lot of that when it's baked in, it's really hard. Once it's been digitized, it's hard to go back and fix that kind of stuff. So a lot of times also, you know, maybe there was an extreme left and right imbalance as far as volume. There could be extreme left and right EQ imbalance. There's distortion. On a few instances, there were the tape was transferred from the tape was played back from the reverse side. So if you think about tape, audio tape, you know, we all seen the brown audio tape. One side has the iron oxide, and that's where the sound lives. Right. Underneath that is just a plastic, a polymer backing, which just holds that, that music onto it. If you flip the tape over and play it from the backing side, you will hear music. It'll sound terrible. It'll sound, what it does, sounds like music with a, you put poo, two pillows over a speaker. Right. Hold on. Like really muffled. Um, and there's, we had a few songs like that to work with but the songs were so great and i'm just like you know such a knucklehead i'm like well i can do something with that i must make something out of this <laughs> well it's a challenge so without but i mean without giving up any trade secrets uh, uh but what did you what do you how do you do that how do you well, you know it's funny because i was thinking about i was thinking about the beatles uh, you know this beatles project that was such a, a groundbreaking thing where they managed mm-hmm. to you know get the stems of things and i was thinking this was would really be kind of a project a restoration project that would probably have benefited from that sort of a thing where you could just take every everything apart with AI somehow and and yeah. put it back together. But w- where do you even begin? And what, what do you I, do? I did a little bit of that. In fact, that came late. So I started working on these like about three years ago. And I did, I you know, I did every trick that I knew how to do to get mm. these sounding, you know, up to up to where it, they should be. But the, 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 the really bad ones were the ones I was talking about where they're transferred upside down. And, and there was just, if you think of, there's just, it's all low end and no high end. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do is put an EQ on it and start raising up the high end and lowering the low end and see what's there. Is it it good? Is it distorted? Is it possible to work with? It's almost like I'm thinking of when you hear a car outside of your house with the bass playing and you you know, you hear that bass. And sometimes when that happens, I'm thinking, well, what is this song? What is it? I should know what this is. But you can never really figure it out because it's very difficult. Right, yeah. right. If you, yeah, or yeah, like if you're if you're an apartment liver, like think about somebody. Uh, you're, the next room over has their stereo cranked up loud. That's what it sounds like, exactly. right? <laughs> um, so, so once I start raising the top end on these, and I'm doing significant boosts, like 20, 30 decibels. That's that's a lot. That's a yeah. lot. Um, I'm bringing up a lot of hiss. I'm bringing up a lot of other distortion and clicks. You know, any, every time you start to try to fix something you've opened the door to maybe five to 10 other things that you've got to address. Right. But I can, I can, this is what I do. I've learned to address all these weird little things. And for the most part, after I got doing my, my crazy EQ curves, what I ended up with was a recording that the, the band, the instrumentation sounded really great. Um, I was able to reduce the hiss because once you bring up all that 30 decibels of high end, all that hiss is going to come with it. Right. So I was able to reduce that down to a, a normal level. The only thing that was troublesome was the vocals. Every time this person sang the song, and it's um, either you love me or leave me. Um, and it's... Um, I tried to every find it, but I got sang, it's like 146 songs to go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find that song. <laughs> <laughs> um, every time he sang, there was distortion on, on whenever he hit a high note, and it was just crackly. It was, for lack of... It was hairy. Every time he sang something, it was staticky. Okay. And it just... And I almost left it there because I just didn't know what else to do. I had pulled every trick out that I that I had. And then I started playing for some other project. I started playing around with what you were speaking of, this demixing mm. that is starting to become a thing now. Now, us mere mortals don't have access to the uh to what the Beatles had as right. far as the way they demix the Beatles, um uh the, the documentary and also revolver. But there are some really interesting tools out there, and they can do it. 
pretty transparent. Now, if you put a song into one of these tools and you suck out the vocals just by themselves, right? you can tell that it's computerized. You, there is a almost MP3 kind of sound. It sounds kind of squishy. Right. But if you know how to hide that stuff, you can you can do some nice things with it. So I, that's what I took. I took the song and I thought the only thing that's bugging me is the vocals. So what happens if I take the vocals out? And I did. I did it pretty, pretty, pretty well. And then I just shaved off the EQ, the top end, which is where all that distortion was living anyway. So I, once I did that, put the vocals back with the song, it ended up sounding pretty great. Now, does it sound absolutely flawless, like it's coming off of a quarter inch tape? No, but it sounds really great. And it sounds, it was either that or not use it. So um, I'm really happy with, with the way that turned out. And some of this demixing stuff is really proving to be pretty useful for me. As far as like taking a song and de demixing all the different instruments, making a stereo track out of a mono, right. that's not really what we can do yet because you will hear if you isolate these things you will hear all the weird artifacts and weird distorted things but for like what i did you're not going to hear anything because the music is the, the signal to noise of that i'm hiding the noise um by the music well it's interesting you mentioned you know that it it, it shouldn't a project and back to back to what this is as, as far as being a um a time capsule of songwriters that maybe didn't really all get their due. And this is an opportunity for people to dig deeper into that sound, but um, really appreciate, you know, where it came from, where it emanated mm -hmm. from originally. I mean, so these aren't really supposed to sound um, so great because even though the demos, and by the way, listening to these demos, you, if you didn't know you were really listening to demos, you really wouldn't know you were listening to, to, to demos in many cases. That's what in I some tell cases, people, yeah. Yeah, in some cases, some cases you know, yeah. it's kind of sparse and you're like, well, okay, you you'd want to add something else, but the the basic tracks that that they put down are are really terrific. So how did you kind of so you had a funny job though, right? Cuz you're wearing two hats. One is sort of as a as a restoration guy and the other is mastering. So you want to retain that um you know, uh, spontaneous energy. You want to retain that, you know, the slightly rustic nature of some of these. The the it, it, again, it's not a bad thing. It's it's mm. an exciting thing, you know. And yeah. and as is laid out in the liner notes, also many times in the recording industry, sometimes people say, "Hey, man, the demo was better because it had." <laughs> even though you didn't spend uh, ten thousand dollars on that song, you may have captured a certain kind of energy in the original take or the original moment. You know, an hour after you wrote it so how did you sort of walk that line between making it too good almost well there are some you know the, i let the songs the recordings dictate what how i proceed with it like you mentioned there were a few that really sound like you know it's a little small handheld recorder where somebody hit record and play right. and did the song either just with a guitar and voice or a piano and voice and you can hear like the little i'm thinking of a cassette player you can hear the motor sometimes going right here and for something like that we just decided to lean into it and like I, I kept on a couple of them you could hear the kerplunk of the record and play button button and i thought well let's just leave that in because there's no hiding the fact that this is just a cassette recording right let's just let's just put a spotlight on it and, and it's, it's just cool. kind of fun that way i left the same thing at the end when you hear like there's a big kerplunk at the end and, and someone hits stop but for the other songs if if they and most of the songs were, were fall in this category they actually were pretty malle malleable in the in the fact that I can make them sound pretty great. So why not do that? And I'm still not, you know, they're never going to sound like they recorded last week. I just want to get them. Whenever somebody asked me just recently, what am I aiming for when I when I master something like this or anything in general? I want to get the listener as close to the performance as possible. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm also these songs are so so great. I I mastered them. To be just not an archival deep dig, but a fun summertime listen. And I, I imagine them to be played loud. <laughs> so right. that, what that means is, and they sound good loud. I've listened to this recording so many times. Um, you know, but just a balance, balanced EQ overall. A lot of these, a lot of the recordings can be really mid range heavy. And if you just, you know, balance out, out a little bit with some of the top and the low end, the, the ingredients are there for a really great sounding song. And I, and I think it just resonates more when you can crank it up and just feel it and, and not, and not feel like you're on an archival, you know, journey. Right. Right. Yeah, you but, can, you can certainly go that route, but this is a, this is a, this is, this is pool time music. 
Well, and the cool thing is it's balanced. You know, there is a little bit of that dig, which is fun. And then yeah. you go back to, to the other stuff, which is, that's you know, right. you, you manage to make it. You, the problem is you're just too good. I think that's the problem. <laughs> the, if you, well, if, it makes me crazy when I, when I can't do what I want to do. I hear the sound in my head. And that's when, you know, that's the thing. You know, Cheryl and I work so well together because we're so crazy this way. We just won't give up until we've tried every last thing. And again, she's spent forever on this thing. And, and I spent, you know, we were working on this thing for years before none of us, we weren't getting paid for this. We just really wanted to make this thing as, as awesome as it, pro as it possibly could. Right. Like, it's interesting to think how long it was, uh, uh, how long it took you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mac Rice's demo for Respect Yourself really caught my attention and yeah, gives awesome. the listener a totally different view of the song that they've heard a thousand times. And as, of course, you're 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 all of these things, but you're also a music fan. Was there anything that really jumped out at you that was like, oh, man, I mean, we're talking about, like I said, 146 songs. There, so it's there's hard to so pick many. One or Not two. a lot of the ones that jumped out me at me were the songs I didn't know. Like, mm. There's there's two songs. Some of my favorite songs are on disc six, and the, the discs the first two songs on disc six are um, uh, too much. This song called "Too Much Sugar for a Dime," and it's it's so great. And the the the, the first song is Homer Banks. Homer Banks is demo version of it. Now it's sung from a female perspective, and he's singing that. Um, and this almost didn't happen, Cheryl, because think about what I was saying earlier. A lot of these files were. There was no descriptive item name in the title. We just had, you know, numbers dot wave, and I sort of had a, a spreadsheet where I'm cross cross referencing. So she, we talked about we're going to use this song too much sugar for a dime, and I pulled the Homer Banks song, and did that, and it's sent to Cheryl, and she said, no, no, I'm looking for the the Betty Crutcher version. Oh, we said listen to that one. I thought, God, that's great, but so is Homer Banks's version, and we started talking about it. And Cheryl decided, well, let's just put them both on because they're so great. Yeah. And it shows the progression. So when you listen to the Homer Banks, you, you're you're thinking, and that is a that's a real demo. It's very sparse. It's um it's just him, I think maybe guitar and uh piano, maybe. But it's still absolutely killer. And then you hear and you think, how much better can this be? And then Betty Crutcher's version comes on with backing vocals and everything. And then you're just in a whole other world. That's it's great. Yeah. And back to respect yourself. Um, you oh. hear Mac Rice sort of, he's sort of giving some arrangement nudges too. He's saying oh, yeah. that he has those parts that really didn't make it. You know, there, there's something similar. I was trying to think about it today. You know, the, the staple singers do, do something similar to not exactly the same, but I was like, oh, he's writing this song and he's like, hey, you know, I'm also going to throw in a couple of ideas, which I thought was really cool too. And I, yeah, and I liked them. I liked those. I liked what he was doing there. I love that. And there's another one. I can't remember the song where you'll hear they're they're just rocking along and you hear somebody the, the vocalist whoever's singing it says change and you hear them change. So he's directing them as they go. Right. And then right. a lot of times you'll hear them like make little vocalese, like like do to do. Well, they'll, they'll do something and you realize, oh, they're saying that's where horns should live. That's right. that's the horn section that they're sort of vocalizing. Right, sort it's of help, helping along that arrangement. It's uh, it's pretty cool because they, they're they hearing it as the writer too. They're going, oh, you know. And it's funny because you might hear a song and one person might hear uh, something that would work with it and another person might not, you know. And so, mm -hmm. so they, and they're never going to, they may not be in the same room while they're, you know, after the, when the final product is being recorded, that songwriter may not be there to say, hey, I had this, I, you know, when I was writing this. So they kind of printed it on that demo tape, which is kind of cool. It's like a little, yeah. Little, uh, a little uh, trail of crumbs that's right it absolutely but then also it's such a small operation that they all know each other so they will like henderson thigpen he was he was one of the, the the composers and he he tells a story he actually after i can't remember the artist i think it was betty crutcher who who performed it um but he he took the day off from work and he had a side job at the time to to coach her with, with how she should speak this monologue at the beginning of his song so yeah, they, they they absolutely laid down some blueprint in that demo, but that didn't stop there. Sometimes they would work with the artist about their vision for the song. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes the artist just took it in their own direction that they want. But there was definitely a lot of uh, uh, working back and forth. In right. Stacks. And it's funny that you mention you know them being in the same room and. 
you know, how here we are in, in the year 2023 and uh, so many people are doing work from home and everything is so, uh, you know, online now. But it's yeah. another thing that was brought up in the liner notes here was how people were not only if they weren't in the same room, they were at least in the same building. And that's secretaries or accountants or maybe the, mm-hmm. the publishing people were down the hall. So there was still this this feeling of, um, you know, uh, working together and getting input from people that you might not normally uh, get into. Did you think about this? Because I'm, I'm sure. How did you guys a project this big, too? How did you all kind of come together to discuss this and how it was being put together? Um, you know, was there a how, how did the camaraderie work with you on this project? Well, with first of all, you're team. right about the stacks, and 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 I mean, can you imagine a, a, just a, a just how great that situation would be? And it's there's nothing better working with if you're in a creative, and no matter what you're doing, if you're working with somebody and you guys are on the same, every people on the same page, right? And you're at the same skill level, it's just nothing better than than that. Um, for this one, we started this. It was uh, I want to say it was either a little before or right during. COVID lockdown. So we were right back doing virtual, virtual work, doing a lot of this work. But because it was so, like I said, by three years, we were working on this. Cheryl um, lives part of the time. She lives about half a mile from me here. And this is my studio is, oh, is in the close. house. Yeah. Yeah. And but also her wife um, is uh, she's a, she's a president of Reed College in Portland, Oregon. So they spend part of the time in Portland and part of the time here. So whenever Cheryl was back in town we would you know she'd come to studio we would listen to stuff but she has a she has her own little studio at her house so i send her files she you know she's always usually happy with everything and then she might have a note or two and then a lot of it was back and forth that way but near the end it was really great to be able to come into the studio and really really absorb everything and and really tweak everything to be honest cheryl is She's great to work with. I'm I'm the tweaker. I'm the one who will not let it go. I think a lot of engineers are that way yeah. until the very last minute. I think I think I yeah, I know I I was up to the very last second saying, let me just make a half decibel right. change in my EQ here. <laughs> right. And it was a, it sounds good, Michael. It sounds fine. It sounds great. It's great. <laughs> but wait, I can do better. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. I know the feeling. Um, You and I have spoken in the past a little bit about the frustrations and challenges that uh, exist in the analog realm. Uh, This project seems really perfect for a digital release simply because of its sheer size. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but if the set were on vinyl, and I did some quick math, which tells me it would be approximately 12 discs, you know, it'd be like a a 12. Yeah, as Cheryl says, it would be a doorstop. And, you know, I don't know. Yeah, there is not, never say never, you just, you never know, but um, that's a business decision that I'm not a part of, and it's up to craft if they want to, if they want to do that, but there have been a lot of people expressing interest in that. Oh, really? So what do you think? Do you think it would be, I mean, obviously you, it would translate great, I think, right? I mean, uh, and I, and I love the fact that um, this set fits on my seven inch, uh, my seven inch shelf. Because yeah, it's sort of, design. you know, it's well, yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, would there be any um, difficulties or considerations into putting this on vinyl again, aside from the fact that it was just a, a big old, it's a big old project? Yeah. And for me, not really. Everything, we may have talked about this before, but the way I, my approach to mastering is um, I master, no matter what the project is, I master as if it's going to vinyl. I sort of like, really like those restrictions. Uh, that means I have to pay attention to the low end. I have to pay attention to the top end, the, my overall level, compression, right. dynamics. Um, and if I if I meet those goals to make a great record, it really translates well for streaming, especially with some of the, you know, the past five or six years. I'm not sure when they started doing this, but all the streaming services have these normalization algorithms, and they're all a little bit different. Right. And they will penalize you if you make a song too loud. Uh, if you really limit it or make it super compressed, if you if it ends up in a playlist, it's going to play a little bit softer. Mm. Um, and everybody's trying to make their song louder. So if you will end like actually end up shooting yourself on your foot if you make a song super loud and send it to Spotify and ends up on a mix, it's going to play louder than than some of the other songs. So every song on here is just ready to go for vinyl. I would just have to 
you know, make the side splits, you know, but these songs go to side A, side B, on to side Z, or whatever it ends up being. One of the other things that's really interesting to me was the ability to listen to the instruments in greater detail without the larger arrangements. For example, you know, those of us that really love vintage guitars or amps and oh, stuff, man. we love those sounds, but sometimes in the finished product, you know, there's only a little, a little snippet to hear in the song with this little riff or something, you're going, oh, listen to that, you know, that cool uh, Telecaster thing or something. But on this, you can clearly hear those amps and the guitars and the settings they were using and the tremolo speed. And uh, for me, that was a really exciting glimpse into uh, something that you really don't get the the full focus on on a lot of those records uh, of the past. I, I love that sound, too. I mean, when you hear Steve Cropper hit some of these licks and, and that's again, I'm trying when I'm mastering, I want to make there's only I'm limited as to what I can do as a mastering engineer. But there are some. You know, if you pay attention to certain EQ points, like in the low end, the low low mid range, you can really, you can really bring some life into some of those guitar riffs, and it just just makes them even more buttery. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I I always I I pay if all the you're right. I agree. Everything. All these instruments instruments sound so good, and I want to make sure I just highlighted all of them as best I could and keep it balanced. Um, but I love hearing those guitar riffs by themselves. Yeah, and that stripped down nature of some of the takes are just they they give the listener the opportunity to really focus on a certain sound, you know, which is mm -hmm. again, it's just not something that you're able to do in the in the larger production. So, yeah, yeah, I thought that was yeah. fun. Yeah, I've spent so much time with these recordings, and honestly, I started. I haven't. I had to take a break for about a year or so, and I just started listening to it when it came out, and hey, I still love it. <laughs> uh, well, that's rare. Yeah. When I'm done with a project, I'm usually done with it. <laughs> Well, that's that's true because you've and again you're talking about years and years and years that you've been working on this. So you know the fact that you want to listen to it for fun is you know oftentimes when we finish a project, right? It's like that's the last thing I want to hear. So so you've yeah. still got Not some because mileage it's bad on this. because I have I have completely absorbed it in every fiber of my being. And next, what's the next thing? What's but the next this, thing? This one is fun to go back and revisit. When a listener breaks this box set open and really starts to delve in you know what should they be aware of of what they're hearing obviously we've covered a lot of ground here in this conversation but as the as the guy again you're wearing two hats on this project as a as a restoration person and also as a mastering person you know what auditory elements do you really hope that listeners catch on while they listen to these tracks and maybe it's the same answer but maybe i'm asking it a different way what are you most proud of in this project that you really hope people will appreciate and and take away with them what i'm at the end of when i got to the finish line of this <clears throat> what i'm really most proud of is how consistent it all sounds together and how it it really from all these crazy disparate recordings that we had it it sounds like an album to me it sounds like a finished thing and i know that may sound weird to somebody buying a thing, but buying a finished CD that, it, yes, it should sound like a finished thing, but it was such a hodgepodge when we first got it. Now, again, the core, all these songs were fantastic, but if you had heard how crazy these songs sounded before I started working with them, right. I wasn't sure. I had a pretty good feeling that I could get them all close together, I'm, but I'm really happy with how it all turned out and it's so cohesive and it's such an enjoyable listen. Sometimes we work with, I work with um, historical projects and there's a compromise that you just have to accept. And it, and that compromise might be, this is a really great historical recording. You're gonna have to deal with some unpleasant auditory issues. <laughs> right. This one, there's not any of that. It's just a great listen. So you really, like I said earlier, you can listen to this with two different ears. You can just have fun uh, and just put it on the background and, and put it on the uh, shuffle or whatever. Or you can really just study this. And there's a lot to study here. This this is, you know, excellent, excellent song craft. So, you know, I think a lot of um, songwriters and I know a lot of bands who were writing us and saying, this is some killer stuff. And someone might cover these songs, which would be great because a lot of these artists, these, these songwriters that helps them out. Um, and it might just inspire young songwriters just to see how this craft was 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 back in the day. Yeah, it's fun to hear the songs that you're familiar with. It's fun to hear them in their uh, primitive stages, but it's also fun to hear these songs. You know, I, I don't know what this is and, and where did this come from? And this has been, yeah. you know, it's it's also a snapshot into the entertainment world and the music business where 
you know, sometimes being really good isn't, isn't good enough or having something really special to offer. Just the timing is off or there's some that's other right. reason that something doesn't click. And this box set is, you know, it's, it's really amazing uh, that you have, we have the opportunity to, you know, delve into this stuff and to, to do this and that there's an audience that wants to learn about it and that there are record labels that are willing to really take a deep dive and, and folks like you and Cheryl who did really hard work that, you know, you, you did this to put this together and, and, and bring some of these things to the light of day. Yeah. If you think about what she did again, you know, she wasn't, she's been, this is just in her spare time. She had probably 2,500, 3,000 hours of recordings to go through, to sift through, to find out, you know, this good song, bad song. When she got those back to the, uh, the other conversation about how these recordings, so they were transferred to DATS. And then at some point, you know, DATS start to go bad. And I'm thank goodness they had, at some point, maybe 10 years later, they had transferred these DATS to hard drives. So that's great because the DATS, <clears throat> DATS don't age well. They start to degrade and then it's not like an analog tape where after if it's analog tape starts to degrade, you might lose a little top end. Once digital recordings start to degrade, you just uh, you hear these ear piercing noises. It's it's like uh, chunks of music are replaced with ear piercing noise. It's yeah, terrible. I didn't realize that dats were so. Um... I re I'm old enough to even remember, you know, I think I, ha I have some dats from some yeah. recordings that I'd made in the in the 90s. And that was sort of pretty cutting cutting edge stuff, you know, oh, totally. we're going to put it on dat. And, you know, and I, I, I didn't realize that there was such an um, opportunity for them to go bad so so quickly, because that's not really that long ago. Right. I mean, it's not 25 years ago. Maybe people were they using started when I first started hearing dats that were bad. It was it was around the time I, I started. So it's about 20 years ago that this started to raise its head. And and again, you're, you're listening to a, a beautiful recording. Um, and all of a sudden, there's just screeching sounds. And there's no way to fix that. Sometimes a little ticks like digital ticks, mm. you can clean those up with like a declecker like you would use for a, a vinyl transfer. But these large, like, horrendous sounds they're chunks of audio gone. Yeah, it's just yeah, like all missing the digital, sound. There's a period there from when we we're made the transition from analog to digital before we went to hard drive, where they were just trying every format, you know, once every every year, there was a new format coming out for either for digital video or digital audio. And it was all, they were laying digital information on the tape. And that has proven to not be a great uh uh, idea for longevity because none of this media is aging well at all and right. then the machines them that play them you know the, the we're already those machines are getting 20 30 years old and nobody's making those hard to find somebody to actually work on them the heads are going it's a it's a it's a bad situation if um if you've got digital tape start thinking about and you haven't backed it up start doing it now that's your public service head. announcement in this uh, in this interview uh, everybody yeah. e everybody out there if you have digital tape yeah yeah because if it's not going bad now it will trust me it will start to go well i mean hard drives everything nothing lasts forever i mean it's funny because back to vinyl you know you can right. still no, we that's... can still play our records from 65 years ago or 60 years ago and Look, um, i'm playing 78s from the 1910s so <laughs> there's something to that right uh but yeah, and, but the good thing about once we get them digitized, then it's just a matter of copying and pasting or putting them in three or four different locations. You know, you're safer that way. If it's on a tape, it's probably going to go bad. And while I have you here, I just am curious about your take. I know we talked a little bit about AI and stuff like that, but have you seen anything uh, on the horizon that's really interested you as, uh, you know, as far as technology or software coming down uh, the road that's really going to, uh, knock people's socks off, which everybody's socks have been pretty knocked off uh, in the last uh, year or so anyway with these developments. But has any have you seen anything else that's been particularly interesting to you? Some of the, the demixing stuff, like I talked about earlier, that's really exciting to me and not in a way that I have, I have some mixing engineer friends who are excited about it. And that doesn't really do it for me. I, I just want to be able to, if I'm working on a restoration project, I want to be able to. I want to have every tool that I that I can to to rescue a, a recording. Yeah. Here's an example that I used. The, I think this might have been one of the first things I did that used the demixing on. 
um it was about a year ago i think this was for omnivore recordings it was um uh janice joplin uh one of her it was an early recording she made with yorma it was in his apartment in new york and this has been bootlegged forever it's called the typewriter tapes because it's just yorma on guitar and janice and i'm, I'm assuming i mean it sounds like the microphone was right next to yorma and his guitar janice was maybe a little bit farther away and then yorma's wife was was typing somewhere in a typewriter and this is in a loft in, in new york and somewhere in, in the city mm. so you saw this this echoey spacey room with a typewriter and a guitar and vocalist and they're great performances they are just killer performances but she's a little farther away the typewriter is a little too up front right the balance is way off and also since these have been bootlegged forever the this their speed was way off on some of these boots because I, I got all of them to, to see what was out there tons of wow and flutter um to like intermittent speed issues of the tape um we got a good recording from dat i think someone had taken the tape and put it to dat and then that was to hard drive so i That's got a wave file and i what i did was i used the demixer and I, I took i took out janice's voice well i basically separate the whole thing and right now there's no you can't say hone in on this hone in on this it's sort of very basic in that it will try to find a guitar it will try to find a piano it will try to find percussive try to find voices and then mm. there's like an other <laughs> the typewriter ended up in percussion and i don't think anything ended up in other but i had a guitar a vocal and an other or and, and percussive percussive now it's called the typewriter tapes forever i can't eliminate i could i could take out the typewriter completely right and it sounded great but i can't do that right. so what i did was I brought Janice's voice up um, to be equaled with a guitar. Now, like I said earlier, these are not perfect tools. You can hear sort of watery sounds. So I didn't just raise the level of her voice. I took her voice out and added a compressor to it so that it, it just gave it a little more heft, a little more weight to her voice. And I added that back into the mix. So I still had the original vocal in there, right? And I had the new process vocal on top of that. So any weird artifact, digital, footprint that i left it it's completely masked now right filled it in bring it back with the guitar turn the typewriter down a little bit and you've got a much am i playing with history not really i'm playing with the chord at recording but again i want to put you the listener in the room with this performance and i want i want to be too distracting i still want to sound like you're in this loft um and i was able to do that so that's exciting to me to be able to again get closer to the performance that's what i'm always trying to do right yeah, fascinating. You're, you're like uh, creating a, a a stage scene. You know, it's almost like you're uh, deconstructing and then reconstructing. It's a, it's really exciting yeah. stuff. Uh, I know you're always working on so many projects, and I know many of them are top secret, and you can't talk about them. But anything, um, anything coming up that, or maybe that's just released. Of, of course, the maybe the Janis Joplin thing is fairly recent, but uh, that was came out else? record store day last year, so it's out. I think I think the the there's the vinyl and CD are still available. So that's a fun one. It's quick. I think it's only about a half an hour. But if you're a Janis fan, you probably know about it already. But um, but it's it's a cool listen. Let's see what else is fun. Um, you know, I love all kinds of music. I'm doing another thing with with Cheryl. I, I love working with. Um, she has. A, Omnivore has a relationship with Art Pepper and, and his estate. Okay, um, so that's right. I got the craft some... uh, the craft um, reissue uh, last year, the record store day. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, uh, there's another one we're working on. It's a multi disc set. Uh, I'm probably can't talk about. I'll just say of uh, generalities. There's a really cool Art Pepper <laughs> set coming up. I think it's about mm, I want to say four or four or five. No, it's been so long. I think maybe seven seven lps wow okay yeah cool fun. so this will be on vinyl so this is great these are all high res so that's fun um i still get to work with some of my my friends at analog africa and he's always doing great things with um i'm getting ready to start on let's see there's a really great record that came out recently called equatoriana it's ecuadorian music but it's, it's all these just far out synthesizers killer killer music if you're cool. into synths or early synths yeah check out uh, analog africa ecuadoriana equatoriana that's out now yeah yeah oh, cool I you find it on Bandcamp, and then vinyl he does great great packaging if you're, if, if you're vinyl fans that's up my alley for sure 
Yeah. Well, cool, Michael. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I thank you so much. And I think I said uh, last time we spoke, I said, you know, you're not just a, a mastering engineer. You're also a superhero because oh. you you <laughs> I have you a cake next time, you've okay? maintained your uh, your categorization as a superhero because what you guys did was uh, was amazing here. And uh, again, it's not only is it fun to listen to, but it's something that's really important. It's um, it's entertaining and educational, kids. So um, so thanks for the hard work that you put in here, and thanks for spending some time to explain it to me and to us. Well, thanks so much, Evan. Thanks for giving the opportunity to talk about it. And uh, yeah, have fun with it. (laughs) 